We're going to start um, by uh, talking about how to extend Kubernetes with WebAssembly modules. And with that, I have my talk with Flavio. Flavio is not here in person, but I'm going to play uh, his video, and then I'm going to continue working and I'm talking about uh, continuing the talk. So let me just. Hi, everybody. I'm Flavio Castelli from Suzy Rancher. I'm here today virtually, but you will find my dear colleague Raphael on stage. We are here today to talk about how we could use WebAssembly to extend some pieces of Kubernetes. So inside of this room, there are many of you that are already playing, experimenting with WebAssembly, building cool things. Uh, many of you are already uh, using WebAssembly to build functions as service platforms. This is a fantastic use for it. Others might have used WebAssembly as a way to implement plugin systems. So you take an existing program and then you grow it by uh, using plugins to add new features, new capabilities. But this time the plugins are going to be delivered as WebAssembly modules. This is exactly what we're going to do today. And the program we will try to, to extend with WebAssembly is going to be the Kubernetes control plane. So Kubernetes, if you think about that, it has already some points of extension. You can bring your own scheduler. You can bring on dynamic admission controllers. And this is the last point, the dynamic admission controller. This is what we are going to be talking about uh, today. So Kubernetes has some admission controllers that are built into its own binaries. Think about pod security. But if you want to implement new rules, then you have to resort to dynamic admission controllers. They work in this way. You have external webhook servers that are being uh, approached by the Kubernetes API server. So they, the API server is going to send um, requests to be evaluated to them, and they're going to respond with uh, or respond back with a, with an outcome, which could be accept a request, reject a request, or accept a request with some changes, which would be a mutating admission controller. So they're all running outside of Kubernetes. The majority of the times they are inside of a very same Kubernetes cluster. And it is working. This is a proven technology that is being used by many projects, many open source projects, such as Open Policy Agent, Gatekeeper, uh, Kyverno, and last but not least, uh, Kubewarden, which is an open source project that I contribute to. It's a project we, we submitted to CNCF for, for inclusion inside of Sandbox. What makes Kubewarden different from, uh, from the other projects I mentioned is the way of writing and distributing uh, policies. So in the Kubewarden case, you can take uh, a regular programming language or you can use Rego, which is the query language introduced by Open Policy Agent. And then you compile this policy into a WebAssembly module that then is distributed using a container registry and then is executed by a webhook server, our webhook server, which is capable of running WebAssembly. And you know it has a plugin system based on WebAssembly that allows it to gain more and more policies to be to be run. So this is something that is working. Uh, it's working well. We are pretty happy about our decision to embrace uh, WebAssembly for, for this task. But uh, I've always been thinking about what if you know we could uh, reuse part of these uh, uh, ideas of Kubernetes uh, straight into the uh, Kubernetes control plane? What if we could actually run policies uh, that we define inside of the control plane, making them basically like admission controllers, you know, the ones that are bundled inside of it, but without having to submit uh, all this custom code for our, you know, customer specific needs into the upstream Kubernetes uh, repositories. So the idea basically is to make the API server uh, aware of WebAssembly and make it uh, leverage uh, computational units uh, written using WebAssembly, basically have a sort of function as a service platform inside of the API server, which is there to evaluate incoming requests about, and, and use policies while doing that. So 
why would we be doing that? You know, what do we gain from doing that? I think there are a couple of advantages. So first one is we get a more predictable outcomes when evaluating policies. That's because with dynamic admission controllers, the API server is reaching this webhook server and then is, is waiting for an answer, which could be accept, reject, mutate, or it could be nothing so a timeout or it could be an HTTP status code so this is the kind of uh, unplanned failures that you have to take into account when you register a webhook and uh, this is where this setting about failure policy is going to determine what what happens what has to be done by the API server so you can pretend like nothing bad happened so you set it to ignore and so the request is is accepted even though the web uh, the webhook server didn't say anything about it uh, but in doing that you might let something dangerous get into your cluster and by the time you notice that it might be too late or what you could do is to be more strict and, and set it to fail which means that you're going to reject everything even things that are uh, legitimate but then you risk of uh, having a kind of denial of service because uh, the webhook server is down and nothing can be done inside of uh, inside of a cluster so it's a, it's a tough place to be uh, there is no clear answer to what to, to set for these policies uh, for the failure policy but uh, if you move uh, the policies into the API server, then you don't have all this uncertainty anymore. So this is one reason for, for going ahead with, uh, with this idea. The other reason is, I don't know about how you feel about that, but you have kind of a, of a gut feeling that a lot of resources inside of Kubernetes clusters are actually used to run infrastructure code, not user workloads. So take, for example, the keyboard and stack. We have a webhook server, which is there, waiting for requests to be evaluated. It could be doing a lot of uh, request processing, or it could be sitting idle. It all depends on, you know, the amount of, uh, of load that you have on, on, the, on, the, on the infrastructure, how many requests are being sent and made against, uh, against the API server. And at the same time, you have a controller, which is there doing its own reconciliation loop against custom resources and it could be doing a lot of reconciliations or it could be doing just nothing so what if we could you know get rid of, of those two you know pieces of a stack and just uh, have the policies being run on demand function as a service inside of the api server i think this would be great for certain scenarios certain environments where resource usage is really important think about edge scenarios where you have a limited hardware and you have to make the best use of it and uh, the best use of it is to leave as much space as possible for user workloads so if we go ahead with this experiment this is what we we can uh, allow our our users to, to do so the, the idea that uh, we're going to explore and that I actually implemented with uh, this uh, proof of concept is to basically run WebAssembly policies inside of, of the API server. Now, big disclaimer, uh, I don't know how this is going to end. I mean, this is working, but uh, this is a big change and maybe people will be uh, completely against that and I get it and so I didn't want to invest too much time and uh, and energies in, into into that I don't want to maintain a downstream fork of Kubernetes just to have this uh, this feature that means I try to reuse as much as possible uh, from the Kubernetes project because we have plenty of WebAssembly policies ready and I, I know the stack so but that doesn't mean that you know if we decide to go further with this uh, POC it doesn't mean that we have to embrace uh, the whole keyboard and uh, uh, primitives and, and, and stack so that being said what uh, I've done I have introduced a new feature gate inside of Kubernetes that is capable of running this queue warden policies capable of downloading them from container registries so let's see that in action so here I have a simple k3s cluster made by just one node which is running only the, the vanilla uh, k3s stack so there is no queue warden in there this is a patched version of K3S, but as the feature gate I'm talking about turned on, and this feature gate I'm talking about, it has its own configuration file. So let's take a look at that. Here you can see that we are defining one policy, which is called privileged, which is being downloaded from this uh, container registry. This is an unchanged keyboard and policy. Uh, this policy is interested about pods, about creation and uh, up update operation. And this is going to be enforced inside of a default namespace, which means that you won't be able to create privileged containers inside of a default namespace. 
The next policy we have over there is called Trusted Repos. And this one is interested about pod events, create and update, is enforced inside of a default namespace as well. And this is, this is going to reject the containers that are coming from the Docker Hub. So if you try to create a pod which has a container coming from the Docker Hub, this policy will prevent you from doing that. So let's see these policies in action. So first of all, we are going to try creating a privileged container inside of the default namespace. And as you can see, this is being rejected. It is being rejected. We get back a notification from the <clears throat> from the API server in the very same way we would with a, with a dynamic admission controller. Now let's try to create a container that is using an, uh, uh, an image from the Docker Hub, the Alpine image. And uh, again, the creation is going to be rejected this time by the other policy we have enforced. So just to prove you that this, can, this is actually working, let's try to create a privileged pod, but this time into a different namespace, the test namespace. And as you can see, the creation happened. That's because the policies are enforced only inside of a default namespace. Now, every time uh, a request is rejected, this uh, code will also emit a Kubernetes event to keep track of it. Now, I wrote a, a, a kubectl plugin that allows me to, to retrieve this information. And as you can see here, I have a fancy table which contains all the events that happen about uh, rejections. So this is all right now in terms of demo. I will just end back the microphone to Rafa who is going to talk about more interesting things and an Easter egg I put into the demo. All right. Thank you, Flavio. All right. So <clears throat> then we thought, can we use WebAssembly somewhere else? So we already have the API server. We have we can run uh, keyboard and policies on top of the API server. That's fine, but can we do something else with the control plane? Well, we, we thought about maybe logging, doing something fancy with logging, maybe even before getting into, the, into memory or even when it's at rest. So if, if an attacker gets into your machine, they cannot even get the logs uh, from your node, even if it's on memory. Nah, it doesn't sound so important. I mean, it's important, but it doesn't sound so cool for a, for a proof of concept. Uh, authenticate, authentication or authorization, well, you already have the authenticating proxy. Yeah, it's not super nice. Uh, controller manager, it's just a controller. Maybe yes, but no. Nah. Uh, garbage collector strategies, you can use finalizers with that. Add your finalizer whenever you want and then delete it afterwards when you want. So you, you can control garbage collection in the end, uh, even on different namespaces, wherever you want. So yeah, it's not so nice. And yeah, maybe it's something fancy with its CD, but in the end it's just gRPC. So I can just put something in, in front of it or even something completely different as long as I implement the gRPC protocol and that's it. So it's like, yeah, maybe the control plane, we cannot get that much done with WebAssembly right now, um, thinking out of, uh, off, off the top of our head. And so we looked also thinking about the data plane. So control plane, data plane, we see lots of different people doing really, really nice stuff. We have Crasslet, we have uh, run WASI, uh, that allows you to run WASI modules on container D. We have WASMets, we have a lot of different things. And we are talking only about Kubernetes related stuff here where you can run on top of Kubernetes. Um, so you have a lot of things, but then you get a little uh, more into the data plane, like what we, in, understand as that, and we have Envoy and Linkerd. And I'm just going to pick up two examples from them. So with Envoy, you can run that web, you can run WebAssembly today on your HTTP filters. Um, the thing is that, and this, this is something we see right now on almost every project that is using WebAssembly, is that you need to provide the, the local file name, the, lo, the local file name, where, where this WebAssembly module is. Or you can provide an HTTP server. Honestly, I didn't, I didn't look if it checks for, for certificates, if you can use uh, uh, C, a specific CAs from your system. But in any case, there is something clear here that the way in you, you distribute WebAssembly modules is still something that we have to, to work more on that. Um, so that's for Envoy. It's already supported at least uh, most of, of what we can think of, of uh, for writing our filters. Then if you also think about Linkerd, this is the status of the service mess for 2022. And they basically say um, that they are not looking for using WebAssembly for the core uh, logic, which makes sense. Uh, 
but as a, however, as a mechanism for enabling end user plugins, WASM may very well make sense for Linkerd, and it's in that light that we are evaluating it, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because in the end, you have a core, and then you allow that to be extended with WebAssembly in lots of different ways. Okay, so that's the, the, that's the data plane. Then we thought, yeah, maybe the data plane is either something that we, I mean, we, we are not going to write a proof of concept for, for that right now. So what could we do? So we go and get into the user plane. This might sound, you know, interesting. Uh, so we, we have to main CLIs for Kubernetes in the, in the user plane, and that's QCTL and Helm. And so with Helm, we are, you are able already to say, depending on the arts, where you're running Helm, you're going to use this binary or this other binary on this other path, which, you know, for, for, for systems where you have different um, need for different architecture uh, binaries, that's cool. And kubectl is even, you know, it's, it's not even going to check that. It's just going to run what is on the path, and, and that's it. So we thought, what if, I, know, I don't know if you, if you looked for, if you know about Crew. So Crew is the package manager for kubectl. And basically, it's, it was like, what if we try to build uh, something that is Crew Wasm, where you can write your kubectl plugins with Wasm. And this is what we did. Um, actually, most of the work has been done by Flavio, so thank you for that. And, uh, you know, we are distributing uh, the policies as we are doing with QWarden today with OCI distribution. This is written in Rust. And so this is basically what we use for using OCI registries in order to uh, distribute the WASM modules uh, over there. And so right now we brought uh, two plugins. I am only writing this one. Uh, that is the decoder, and this one is, is a WASM plugin, and it's a WASI, in the sense, it's a WASI program in the sense that it has its main, it has everything, so it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a full, let's say, WASI program. And then there is the second one, that is what Flavio was referring to as the Easter egg, and it's what you saw that he ran at the very end, kubectl keyword, and was actually, um, actually a, a clear WASM plugin. So, uh, this is actually, you know, working, and we are really happy about it. So what's better than one demo? It's two demos. So let me check. Uh, let me check if I can say it into there. So we are going to show how CureWasm works. We are able to list uh, the, the plugins that we have installed in our system. This is an empty list, so nothing. Uh, we can pull one uh, plugin from, from the network. This is happening as we are talking. This is not recorded, so uh, maybe it's a little slow sometimes. Uh, I already pulled that, and the, the only trick is that I need to have uh, the, my, my CureWasm in my path so uh, actually the, the, the directory where the, the sim links are created of, for all my plugins need to be on my path, uh, otherwise kubectl is not going to be able to talk to that. Uh, so now if I list that again, I see the decoder one that I just pulled, and now I show that I just have uh, a Kubernetes installation here. So now let's create one secret. And the not so secret things, the not so secret thing about Kubernetes secrets is that they are not really secret. So um, what I'm going to show is how we can show the contents of the secret itself. So I'm going to create one with kubectl. And you know, username, password. And then I'm going to show that with JSON. Okay, we have the base64 over there. That's fine. So now I'm going to run the kubectl decoder plugin that I just downloaded. And this is going to show the contents of my secret, uh, Kubernetes secret. So uh, you can see that. And it shows you know, more information in a table, so it's pretty cool. And also what happens if I show uh, Kubernetes TLS type secret directly, so the decoder knows that, and it will show this in a different way, which is, uh, well, actually, I'm showing this as it is from kubectl, so you can see that. And now I'm going to uh, read that with the decoder plugin. And you can see that it actually goes and, you know, uh, basically and reads the, the, the certificate itself and writes you all the information about it. 
Yeah, I'm just showing here that actually the keyboard and plugin that Flavio showed before is the other plugin that we support. And that's it. I, didn't ha I don't have the keyboard installation that he has where we are re registering events. I don't even have keyboard installed here, so it's going to be an empty uh, output. But yeah, that's, that's the idea. So. So what's nice about WASI today? So the really cool thing is that, you know, it has a WIDX definition. This is going to be ported to WID uh, soon, I think. Uh, then we have primitives that are super useful, clock, file descriptor primitives, environment variables, comma line parameters, and also initial socket support. We cannot create, as we were saying before, we cannot create outbound connections, but we can create inbound connections. We can listen. And so we have inbound uh, socket support. And this is, this is really cool. And you know, what's, what's next? So as I was saying, about network connections, uh, we have WIT, that is uh, what is coming after, after um, the WITX, and uh, yeah, uh, that, that's basically it. Um, we also saw that there is an argument limit uh, when we are using WIT bindgen. Uh, this is going to be lifted as well, because this, this will change with the new uh, binary. Uh, so this is, going to be, this is going to be fulfilled and this is not going to be a problem anymore. And one thing that I love about these examples is that your plugins actually are complete programs in the sense that they are actually going to try to say, they are, going to, they are reading whether you have provided an environment variable called kubeconfig or not. If you don't have uh, provided the kubeconfig environment variable, it's going to try to find that on your home and then we are mounting the home directory, we should reduce that. But it, it will try to go and read the kubeconfig file from your home, the, um, basically, and marshal that and create the, the network uh, to the outside with the, with the Fermion project uh, for the WASI experimental toolkit that allows you to create outbound, outbound connections. So actually, the, the plugin is really creating the SDP requests. And that's, and that's working fine. So what I really love about this is that when, wh where do you draw the line with WASM today? Uh, do you have like uh, functions that you import in your module and you call and they are super complex but on the host? But I, I see that we are uh, day after day making more complex guest programs where we are able to do more stuff in the guest, right? And then with WASI, we just have the exports and we call to that and then we do a lot of stuff inside of the guest, which is super nice because, you know, going uh, always marshalling and marshalling some JSON uh, put it, and putting that to the, get, to the host and then the host will do whatever it has to do. You know, we can do better than that and I think we are, we are doing really good progress there. So some links uh, that you can find on the slides for, for going, you know, uh, the experiment that Flavio did, also the plugins that we have written, crew wasn't itself. So if you have interest about that, just let us know. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is basically it. So that's everything I have. And thank you, Flavio.